Salam, and welcome to the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, brought to you by Fountain Dell Libraries, Adventures in Homeschool, faraway places at your fingertips. Friends, this month, January 2021, we welcome you back after a month off. We're happy to have you, and we are going to take a little trip around the country of Ethiopia. Before we get started, if you popped in the library and picked up your bingo cards, you can get those out now and play with us, or you can wait and after the program play with your friends. Let's get started. Here's our map of the world. We've got North America, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia, and Oceania. And friends, we find Ethiopia right here in the horn of Africa. They refer to this part of Africa as the Horn of Africa because it sticks out kind of like a tusk on an elephant or an animal with a tusk. If we start over here where we live, you could get there either way by going west or east, but I feel like we might say the quickest way would be to go east. Most of the time when you go to Africa, you would leave here and go somewhere in Europe and then head down. So that's kind of the way you travel across the Atlantic Ocean and get there. Um, a little closer look, we can see, again, Ethiopia's in the Horn of Africa. It's surrounded by Somaliland, Somalia, Kenya, South Sudan, Sudan, and Eritrea, and then Djibouti. So all of those countries run at one point in time the area known as Ethiopia went all the way to the Gulf of Aden, but borders have changed over the years, and that is no longer the case. A little bit about Ethiopia. The government is this, the, it's a federal parliamentary republic where there is a prime minister who is the head of the government. Their president, Sahali, work, Zedwa, Zeda, Zeda is the president. That's mostly just for um, presentations and things. The prime minister does most of the work of, of um, the business of the country. Their currency is called the Ethiopian Burr. Their voting age, much like the rest of the world, is 18. And here is their flag. The colors all have a meaning, as often they do. The green stands for hope, abundance, and natural resources. The yellow for harmony and justice. The red for sacrifice. And the star in its rays represents unity and equality. The blue circle stands for peace. So, friends, the capital is Addis Ababa. And it's the highest altitude capital in all of Africa, kind of a little fun fact. And um, feel free to look up and, and check on the computer any facts you want to know about the government. Um, the, the languages they speak there, there is over 80 languages spoken in Ethiopia, a lot of indigenous languages, but um, uh, English and American. Amharic is um, the main language spoken. Since we already speak English, we're going to try the Amharic. And it kind of is very, very similar to um, some of the other languages in Africa. But let's see if we can say it. Hello. So we're going to sound it out with the syllables. Te na i istalen. Te na istalen. Hello. Oh, goodbye. You know, I hate saying goodbye, but let's try it. De na hon. Can you say it with me? De na hon. All right, we're going to say, please, and don't forget to say that with a little bit of wet in your voice. A bakken. A bakken. A bakken, please. Hmm. And of course, we could never forget our good manners and say thank you. Ama shegnehu. Hmm. That's a toughie, isn't it? Um, uh, sh hmm. You want to practice that at home. Yes is a-o, and no 
is I, like I. Now, no is often no in lots of other languages, but in Americ, it is I. So, yes, ow, no, I. All right. Did you know some fun facts? We're going to talk about this a little bit. In 1974, archaeologists in Ethiopia uncovered the, one of the oldest human skeletons ever found. They named her Lucy, and it's estimated that she is 3.2 million years old. Now, you know, scientists are always discovering and uncovering new things. This is a more recent discovery. We'll talk about it in a bit. Ethiopians only eat with their right hands. Hmm. Um, in Ethiopia, there is no such thing as a last name. Ethiopian children are called by their given names, and then they take their father's first name as their second name. Also, when women get married, they don't change their names to their husband's name. They keep their names the same. The ancient kingdom of Aksum has giant stones called obelisks. They're pillars ranging from very small to very tall. And in the walled city of Harar, hyenas are respected and have been fed by hyena men every night for centuries. By hyenas are believed to eat jen, which is evil spirits. That's the legend that they have. Another really interesting thing about Ethiopia, friends, is their calendar is a little different. They have 13 months. Do you know how many months we have? We have 12. They have a 13-month calendar, and the first day of their year is September 11th. So they have all of these 12 months, and then they have this month called Pagum, which just means like extra couple days. So like it kind of means leftovers, which is kind of very interesting. But um, their calendar is a little different. Their time is also a little different. Because they're near the equator, they have roughly 12 hours of daylight and roughly 12 hours of night every day of the year. So instead of starting at 12 midnight and going to 12 noon, they just say 7 a.m. They call that 1 o'clock, like the beginning. And then um, their noon would be 6 o'clock. Their 6 p.m. would be 12 o'clock. And, and, and so forth and so on. Now that is like their common time that they use. If you are in any sort of international business, while this is the Ethiopian calendar and this is Ethiopian time, they do have to sort of conform to the modern rest of the world. So if you were in international business, you would use the regular calendar, regular time. But if you are just learning locally, this is their calendar, and their time. Now, Ethiopia, once known as Ab Abyssinia, was the home of the earliest humans. Their um, scientists say that most human DNA can be tracked back to modern-day Ethiopia or that area of the country of Africa. So, there's a common saying among scientists that we are all Ethiopians, Right over here, you'll find some of the archaeological, what it might look at an archaeological site where they're looking for human remains and the bones that would um, be most like ours today. And we will talk about Lucy. Now, to look at that, here is the human remains they found that they named Lucy. They found those, like we said, in um, 1974 in Hadar. So Hadar, here's our horn. Here's Ethiopia, so it's right up in here. And um, there's, they have made cast molds of her. We could see a cast mold of her skeleton if you go down to the Field Museum, but it opens back up in Chicago. It's not the real one, but it is a cast mold so that we can see what it looks like. It's very different than our skeleton that we have today. Modern food and different different things have made us look a little different over years. It's a little bit shorter than what people are now, a little bit different, but very interesting because it is the first human skeleton. The next slide, friends, I'm going to show you 
is about a place known as La Nivella. These are monolithic churches, and they are all from the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and they are made from one piece of stone, each of them. Now this one, of course, is, is the front face of the one we see dug out here. Archaeologists have been working on Lalibella for years, but as I step out of the screen, there's a lot of um, there, there's a lot to be learned. These churches are from the 12th and the 13th century. They have they started um, uncovering them in 1970, and it was it has become a world heritage site. People take pilgrimages to see these churches from long ago. So it's really kind of exciting. You can see lots of people down here coming to visit this one. Now the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba is mentioned in lots of historical writings. Now if any of you have ever heard of King David and his son King Solomon, King Solomon was known to be very wise. So the Queen of Sheba, who was all that, she had lots of people taking care of her, she had lots of money and lots of wonderful things. She heard about King Solomon's wisdom. And legend is, now all of this is legend at this point, legend is she traveled 1,400 miles with her entourage and all the people who worked for her just to get to meet King Solomon. And she wanted to test him. She had heard that he was very wise, but she wasn't so sure. She asked him all sorts of riddles, and he had the wise answer to everything. He was far wiser than even she suspected. So legend also goes that they were married, and that she had a son, and that he became the next king of Ethiopia. So there's the lineage of Solomon in the area that we know of Ethiopia. But very famous stories. You can find a lot of books in the library about that. Now, when we talked about Egypt, we talk about the Nile River. Well, the Nile River has lots of tributaries. So throughout the area of Ethiopia, here's the Lake Tana, and here is a river coming and we're going to call this the Blue Nile. It's also known as the Abbey River, and its origin, Lake Tana, through, and then it meets up with the White Nile, which then, eats, then meets up with the Nile River that we hear all about all the time. And here's some beautiful scenery from the Blue Nile. Also, there is the Donakil Desert. It's in the northeast area of Ethiopia. It also touches Eritrea and Djibouti. Um, it's one of the hottest places on the planet. It averages 122 Fahrenheit. That's 50 Celsius, but 122 Fahrenheit degrees on average. And it has less than one inch of rainfall all year. These are also in areas where there's fault lines. Does anybody know what happens where there's fault lines? Lots of volcano, lots of underground activity. So you can see from these pictures what it would look like if you were to visit the desert of Donakel. And um, lowest and hottest places on earth known for its volcanoes and extreme heat. All right, friends, our next slide, we're going to talk about something called the East African Rift. So let me explain a little bit. The East African Rift is an active continental rift zone in Eastern Africa. This narrow zone is formed by divergent tectonic plates. So a lot like our ring of fire, it is um, an unstable piece of land and two tectonic plates One's called the Somali plate, and one is called the Nubian plate. And they are constantly moving, and they are making, they are creating volcanic activity and different kinds of land movement. And so with that, 
it's created some beautiful, beautiful scenery. Now, it's been going on for years, and, and of course, scientists say that maybe in a lot of years from now, very possibly that Horn of Africa might separate from the entire continent of Africa. That remains to be seen. But the tectonic movement is through this area. So that's what gives them those ideas. So just something to think about. Some of the indigenous animals, I'm just going to step out of the screen. They have one, one third of the world's frog species live in Ethiopia. How about that? This is the ibex. And here's some Gelda baboons. Hmm. All right, anybody know what this is? Oh, goodness. Um, here's our mountain vervet. Here's a beautiful yellow fronted parrot. A secretary bird. Look at that bird. He has lots of feathers on. And then a Somali wild donkey. We saw Somalia was near uh, Ethiopia, so some animals go back and forth from those countries are common in other countries. But these are just, uh, this is just a taste of some of the animals that are, that are indigenous to Ethiopia. Now, families. A huge portion of families in Ethiopia live in the rural areas. Not as many live in the urban areas. But what is more common, what families would want you to know, is that they live together in households. An average Ethiopian family would consist of three generations. That would be the eldest couple, which you might say were your grandparents, and then their sons, their sons' wives, then the unmarried daughters, and all of the grandchildren of those sons. Now, when their daughters marry, they go live with their husband's family. So you can see a couple of generational pictures here. This is a more urban family, and this is a more rural family, but we just kind of wanted to give you a taste. There are big cities, obviously, and it is so hot that they can live in the huts and be quite comfortable. They don't need all sorts of stuff happening around them. And Ethiopian food. So they have a bread, a flat bread that they use. It's called injera. And you can eat it flat or you can roll it up. And you can see that it, it comes with every meal. Also, something, a big ritual they have there. They call it a coffee ceremony. Now, um, it's, a, it's a ritual of how to make some really, really good coffee. And it's a routine that is done by some families every single day, in fact, three times a day. There's a lot of time spent on the ritual of the coffee ceremony. Um, another thing you can look up on your own, very fun to learn about, but this, this gal is participating in it. All right, friends, so next we're going to invite Miss Debbie up to talk about some great books that cover Ethiopia. Hi, kids. Good to see you this month. So this month I found three different ones that I thought were kind of representative of the population of, of Ethiopia. Um, Jonah Larson's Hello Crochet Friends is about a boy who is adopted into the United States from Ethiopia. It's really interesting. Um, and then Where I Go is about refugees' families. There's a lot of refugees in, in that region and stuff, so it talks about their travels and how much they keep their culture together. And uh, then Omar's Favorite Place is a very sweet story about a little boy growing up in Ethiopia. It's a lot like a, you know, a story about a little boy growing up in the United States. So I just thought it was very representative of the region, and I hope you check into them. You know, please always remember that you can um, give us a call or go on our website, reserve things, we'll put them in the drive through for you, or just come in you know, and browse and, and pick up your things here and stuff. So, um, and you know what's next? My favorite part. So our craft this month is to paint and decorate the Queen of Sheba's treasure chest. Actually, it'll be your treasure chest, but I was kind of fascinated with the Queen of Sheba, so I thought it would be fun to kind of pretend that we were making her a treasure chest. So I'll be sending home some, well, I won't tell you about that. Let's just meet me over the craft table, okay? Okay, see you there. Okay, kids, this is going to be a fun one for you. This is our Queen of Sheba treasure chest. What you're going to get in your kit is 
a set of instructions. This is pretty easy, so I don't think you're gonna need too much of that and stuff. So this is the little box that's gonna come. You're gonna get a sampling of paint, um, a paintbrush, a couple of um, pieces of felt for the inside, and then I'm gonna put a few of these adhesive gemstones in there and a bunch of these, um, these ones that you're gonna to have to glue together. So if you don't have um, liquid glue or uh, tacky glue, um, you could just use these and be done because they'll stick um, on their own. But um, if you wanna put a few more on, you know, you can use that glue and, and, um, and do it up kind of big. So um, I kind of put this one together. I only have so many of these, so I wanted to give as many away as I could. So I'm just gonna kind of show you what I ended up doing. So you take your paint, and if you have a different color at home that you like, it's acrylic paint, so be careful not to get it on your clothes. And what I did was I painted the bottom and the sides of this and the inside like here, and then I kind of set it like this and let that dry. It just takes a couple of minutes, kids. And then I did the top, I did the inside here, and the top part. And um, I wouldn't do the inside just in case if you would put something in there that it wouldn't, um, the paint wouldn't get on it. And that's what the little felt is for. So then um, you can do one coat or two, whatever you wanna do there. Um, I just did one coat and I think it turned out pretty good. And then you're gonna put your little, put some glue on your felt and stick a piece on the bottom like that for a nice cushy little place for your, your treasures and put some glue on the back of that. And, and you might be able to use glue stick for that or your tacky, just don't use too much to get too many bumps, okay? So there is our inside. And then you can take the little adhesive stones that I have here and they just pull off here and stick. We've used them lots of times in homeschool programs. And then, um, like I said, if you wanted to, um, Use the extra ones. You just use your liquid glue or your tacky glue, whatever you have there. And add on your, your stones that way. So I hope you have some treasure to put in the, the little chest and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye. All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed making your Queen of Sheba treasure box. I'm sure yours has all sorts of beautiful colors, and you can keep your treasures inside. Be sure to snap a photo and take a picture and send it to us. And friends, that's a wrap for today. Now here's our slide. Next month, February 2021, we are going to take a trip to Romania. Now, if you've ever come to the library and met Miss Andrea, Miss Andrea was born and raised in the country of in the country of Romania. So she may pop in to have a surprise visit and tell us a little bit about her experience living in the country of Romania. Thanks for coming. We'll see you soon. Pop in and say hi. Love you guys. Take care.